Howdy. Last Sunday afternoon, we had a um, get together out at Rockford Christian Camp. Some of you were able to be there, and it just was—it was really great to be to be together um, because it's been so long since we've been able to do that. Uh, and um, it was just great to be out there. It's a beautiful place, and and we had a great time of fellowship. Jerry did a nice job with the devotional last Sunday afternoon out there, and so um, and of course this weekend. We have a number of our uh, folks out there who are working at Rockford Christian Camp for kind of the Labor Day uh, retreat. And so um, that's just a special place and a special place. I know many of you understand that and have been campers or worked out there in the past. Um, so today with kind of in the keeping of this weekend being Labor Day weekend, I uh, thought that we would look at the idea of a labor of love. And so that's going to be my thoughts for a few minutes today, and, and uh, hopefully it's something that uh, we can be encouraged by as we, um, as we finish up today, as well as go out into the weeks to come. You know, when I was five years old, my parents, they bought two acres of woods on a country road at the top of a hill out in the middle kind of nowhere. Uh, and they began to clear that ground. And it, it took them a couple years to get it to where I thought it's supposed to be as a five-year-old. Uh, by the time I was in first grade, though, there was, it was cleared and, and ready to the point where they had actually built uh, a basement. Um, now, if you are from Deep South, you probably don't know what a basement is, but a basement, a foundation. And we lived in that basement when I started first grade. And so... Over the next couple of years, my parents continued to work that two acres, clearing more brush and, and adding things like a garage and, and building retaining walls and, and doing some more sprucing up, putting in a garden. And so by the time I started third grade, we actually had a house on top of that foundation and, and on top of the basement. So we got to live upstairs, uh, which was kind of cool. And so as an eight year old in third grade, I thought, well, great. We're done. I was wrong. Um, we were never done. And by, I, by we, I mean really my parents were never done. Uh, they continued to find projects to do there in that two acres to, I guess, make it better, uh, to make it more inhabitable, to make it something that they really wanted it to be. And that included things like uh, building a shed and putting in a fence so that we could have a horse, my brothers and I, that uh, they went about putting, kind of cementing the driveway, putting in a basketball goal, clearing more of that two acres. And so by the time that I graduated from high school, I mean, obviously there wasn't much except upkeep to do, but that's what they had done. And they always found time to do that. Even when my dad would work 10 hours a day in the mill, he would come home and he would work till dark working on something on that property or within the house. It became a labor of love for them. Because as a young person, I would often ask why? I mean, why are you doing that? Why are we having to plant a pine tree right there? I mean, we've got trees everywhere. Why are we doing this and that? And, and, and I found out as I looked back when we graduated, when I graduated high school, it was a labor of love for them. They enjoyed doing that because they had something that they put a lot of themselves into. Well then, by the time I graduated college, they had sold that piece of property and they built and, and bought two more acres in the woods about 20 miles away and they started all over again. And again, I ask, why? <laughs> I mean, they weren't getting any younger, um, but they started all over again. And so it was that whole process of clearing, some of you probably can relate to that, of building, of sprucing, of doing little things. Dad was still working, you know, but there was always things to do. But it was because they, it was a labor of love for them. And then it was a few years ago, a couple years before my dad passed away, and, 
and I was talking to my dad on the phone and, and, and he was telling me how his feet hurt, his ankles were swollen, his knees were really bad. He was probably, he was having to get his knees drained regularly. He was going to probably have to have a knee replacement. So he was just telling me that and then at the, he changed gears on this conversation and said, oh, by the way, next week, your mom and I are going to go to the church camp in Eastern Ohio and we're going to work a week in the kitchen. And again, I'm like, what? Why? You just said you have all this pain that you're dealing with. And then you said you're going to go stand for a week on concrete, eight to 10 hours a day. And the temperature was supposed to be in the 90s all week. And I, I said, why? And you know, this time, I guess maybe I got a little different answer or maybe a little clearer answer because dad said, well, we just really like doing that. And I was just like, wow. Church camp had now become a labor of love over the years for them as well. And I think some of you can relate to that. You have those things, whether it's Rockford Christian Camp or whether it's the Helping Hands Pantry or some other works that really are labors of love for you that you do them because you really enjoy doing that. It's something you can do and you enjoy doing that. Well, I don't think it was an accident that the, the work ethic that our parents kind of demonstrated that they lived, my brothers and I were able to see that. And we grew up regularly hearing words like, give your best or always finish what you start. Or don't put off tomorrow to tomorrow what you can do today. Or any job worth doing is worth doing well. And those expressions, they reinforced to my brothers and I, and we witnessed also what that meant when we watched our parents and their work ethic, and they demonstrated these labors of love that they had. And many of you have experienced, I'm sure, some of that same thing with your parents or your grandparents. And maybe you've captured that same essence and you've demonstrated it to maybe your children and your family. You know, as Christians, it takes more than just sitting here an hour or two a week really to have an impact on others around us. It takes more than that. Um, the type of work ethic that we have, whether it's in our regular jobs or it's in our ministries that we work on or it's in those labors of love that we have will have an impact on others. It will have an impact on people. The tasks that we perform, those projects we undertake, I mean the ministries and, and, and even the why that accompanies us doing what we're doing really helps to identify what really has become a labor of love for us. You know there's a there's a passage that I want to share with you that's found in Colossians 3, beginning with verse 22 and going through 25. And I want to share it with you from the message. Every once in a while, I, I refer to that simply because I think the wording kind of fits what we're going to be looking at. And so here's through the message. It says, servants, do what you've been told or do what you're told by your earthly bastards. And don't just do the minimum that will get you by. Do your best. Work from the heart for your real master, for God. Confident that you'll get paid in full when you come into your inheritance. Keep in mind always that the ultimate master you're serving is Christ. The sullen servant who does shoddy work will be held responsible. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't cover up bad work. I thought that was interesting. You see, because this morning, I want us to look at a woman by the name of Dorcas. And many of you will be familiar with the story of Dorcas, and, and some maybe not so much. So I want us to look at, at Dorcas because it was her labor of love that really had an impact on the people around her. And I think it serves to teach us a lesson and give us a great example of just the kind of impact we can have by taking something that we really believe in, that we really are passionate about, and just putting ourselves into it. Even though others may say, why are they doing that? We know why. And so I want us to look at Dorcas. 
I mean, she was a blessing to those who lived in her community of Joppa. She was always going about doing good and helping the poor, is how she was described. We tend to really love the story of Dorcas until somebody comes along and says, well, hey, we need to do like Dorcas did. Well, today I'm that somebody. And I'm talking about me as well as I'm talking about anybody else. You see, when this story took place, when, when the account of Dorcas actually took place for real, probably there wasn't anybody in society who was more destitute than widows. They were usually considered the neediest in the community. And, and they could barely find work to give them food, let alone to take care of the other needs that they might have in life. And so Dorcas helped to fill some of those needs. You know, last week in my message, we talked about, or I talked about having a godly vision. And about having a godly vision can enable us to see opportunities around us where people need things, or they, we can insert ourselves and be a help to someone else. Well, well, Dorcas, I believe, had a godly vision because she saw the needs in the people in her community. And it wasn't just a matter of seeing them, she did something about it. She took action. She seized the opportunity. So I want us to look at Acts chapter 9 for just a minute and begin with verse 36. It tells the story of, of Dorcas. And so we're going to go, go from Acts 9, 36 through verse 42. It says, in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died. And her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them. And when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning to the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. And she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. And then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Dorcas was a disciple of Jesus. You know, a little while before this account took place, there was this persecution of Christians in Jerusalem, and so Christians were scattered everywhere. And it talks about in, in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, that some of those believers who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. So I have to, in my heart, I believe that perhaps Dorcas was impacted by some of those who went out preaching the word, who were scattered abroad. And so Dorcas got to learn who Jesus was and really become a follower of his. Dorcas was continually at work meeting the needs of those in her community, meeting the needs of those widows who didn't really have the means of themselves to even make or get themselves clothed. She made them for those widows, and she helped the poor. She probably had the ability to look at a piece of cloth and, and envision what it could look like when she started to make it and who would be perfect for that. But it went beyond just having the vision. She took action. She did something about the needs that she saw. It was her labor of love. You know, when I think about that, and I think about trying to put myself in that setting. People loved, had to love Dorcas. And she was motivated by not just the fact that she saw a need, but by, I believe, her love for people as well as her love for God. And you'll notice that there are two names in that passage I read to you, two names that are listed. One is Tabitha, which was her Hebrew name. 
and then Dorcas, which was her Greek name. And both of those words mean gazelle. And a gazelle is usually has been used symbolically in the Bible in a couple different ways. Gazelles were symbols of grace. They were symbols of beauty and they were symbols of swiftness as used in the Bible. And I think Dorcas's name is appropriate because if you think about what she did, she was a person who showed the grace of God in her actions toward those in need. She was also a person with a beautiful spirit toward those in her community, toward those widows and others who were needing her help. And she was swift to meet the needs of those when she saw the need because she had that godly vision. So at this point, what about you? Just reflect for a second. Is there a labor of love that you have in your life? And maybe there is. Maybe there's more than one. I know some of you do have those, and you're tireless in what you do. And that's awesome. And it, it has an impact on other people. But then some of us, at times, may be holding back. And in holding back, we may not be experiencing the Dorcas in us, the person who had that vision, who saw a need, and who, who did all she could to impact others in her realm of influence. You know, it's possible to think, I think, sometimes that you could say, well, life is too overwhelming and too hectic for me, and, and I don't even know if what I would do would even have an impact or amount to anything. And so by thinking about that, what we end up doing is sometimes nothing. We end up doing nothing. Dorcas probably didn't solve the financial problems of those women, those widows, or the poor, but she helped. She helped them. She also gave them some self-esteem. She built relationships with them. She demonstrated what love was supposed to be about. And she helped to fertilize their hearts so that they could be open to listening and learning and becoming obedient to Jesus. Her life, her example, her passion, not only talked about and showed her why, it showed the why that she did it, but it also helped those poor to feel valued, to feel loved, to feel appreciated, to feel special, when society tended to overlook them completely. You know, in James chapter 2, beginning of verse 14, James writes this, he says, and it's a familiar passage, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? James is asking questions here to try to challenge his readers, his listeners, to do more than just talk a good game. And this morning in our Bible class, the, the verse that we're using has to do with how we should not just love with mere words, but through actions and through our deeds, through the things that we do. Dorcas did that. James is writing about that in that passage. Dorcas went beyond just saying, well, yeah, I know you're having a tough time. Well, good luck to you. I love you with the love of the Lord, but then not do anything to really be of a benefit. Dorcas didn't do that. In fact, she approached her work in such a way that it had a profound impact on those people. We know that because we just read in Acts chapter 9 how upset those widows and others were at her passing. How mournful that they were. How much she meant to them. You know, sometimes we can become paralyzed through inactivity. We can become stagnant, immobile. You know, what good will this little act of kindness do, we might think. And so as a result, then we don't take any action. We fail to 
cultivate the Dorcas that can be in every one of us. At Dorcas's death, those tearful widows came in the room and they showed Peter all the things that she had made when she was with them. I mean, it wasn't just the clothes that it, she did that impacted them. She was with them. She lived with them. She impacted them and associated with them on a daily basis. And the things that she made for them were just really, again, her labor of love. But I think even more than that, what happened in all of this with Dorcas is this. Dorcas's life had been woven into their lives. And in turn, their lives had been woven into Dorcas's life. And maybe some of you can relate to that because of the labor of love maybe that you have now or that you have had in the past. And if you don't quite understand that, then maybe we need to find that labor of love that just inspires us to bring glory to God through whatever it is that we do. You know, in Acts chapter 10, Peter, we have the account of Peter teaching Cornelius. And, and in that, he talks to Cornelius about, about Jesus. And in verse 38 of Acts chapter 10, he said that Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Jesus set a standard, the standard, when it came to doing good and to demonstrating a labor of love. People were his labor of love. Showing them a different way and a better way to live and to love was his labor of love. Giving himself for all mankind was his labor of love. He set a great example. And Dorcas, in her own way and in her own world, where she lived, was embracing that same idea of having that labor of love and having it influence others. You know, sometimes I think it's difficult to connect our faith with our daily life. You know, we can easily think of our faith as our Sunday thing. You know, that's what I do on Sundays. And our daily life as, well, our daily life thing. And we don't mesh the two together. Well, in the example of Dorcas, those were one. They were meshed together. They were interwoven together. And we need to be able to do that as well. Live a life and develop a labor of love, whatever that may be, so that our faith is really seen through our labor of love. You know, in order to become a Dorcas, you don't have to be able to sew, thankfully. You know, you don't really even have to have a lot of tremendous skill. You just have to have a heart for people. And then find how you can bless them through whatever you can do. That's what Dorcas did. But she took a skill that she had and she used it. She could have probably sold all that stuff and made a lot of money. But she made it for those people who needed what she had and who needed her. You know, we can bring glory to God through our labors of love. Whether that's labors of love have to do directly with things that this church body is doing or things that we do in the community because how we approach it and that work ethic that we have, those things like giving your best. Any job worth doing is worth doing well. We're, we do can do those things still to God's glory, even if it's the things that we do in our everyday life. As long as we make sure our faith and our everyday life really are one. You know, Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth, he wrote this, he said, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Whatever we do that can bring glory to God, maybe by the way we do it, as well as by what we do, isn't going to be in vain then. You know, there are plenty of opportunities, I think, for us to find a labor of love. 
if we haven't already. We can find it in God's kingdom. We can find it here in the North Park Church. We can find it in our community where we live, maybe in our neighborhood, maybe just in our street. We can find a labor of love that really challenges us to be more than just an hour or two a week where we sit and sing and, and then we go do our other things, our non-faith things. You know, the work ethic of Dorcas enabled her to bring glory to God through her labor of love. So my challenge to each of us, and when I say each of us, I include myself, is that may God, through his Holy Spirit, help us to see opportunities that can bring out the Dorcas in each one of us. You see, in doing that, that's going to help us to produce a labor of love. And that's what I think God wants each of us to do as we approach our lives and approach our work and approach our service to him every day, a labor of love.